Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Authority webinar. Uh, my name is Toby Fox. I'm the Managing Director at 3Fox, the marketing agency for councils. Uh, since 2004, we've been running over 30 events a year, bringing councils and the development community together. And during lockdown, we've been doing that through my fantastic team at 3Fox, working their socks off to organize weekly webinars like this. Uh, next Thursday, we're going to be turning our attention to a specific aspect of the housing crisis. And we're going to be asking, do we need a strategy for key worker housing? And then on Friday, we're hosting Waltham Forest Council from North London on our Sitematch 365 platform, where they're going to reveal five significant new development opportunities. I hope you'll all be able to join us uh, again for either or both of those events. But today's topic is what does recovery look like for the core cities? The UK's economic recovery is going to rely on our major cities and their 26% of the share of our GDP to bounce back from this pandemic. So what's needed to ensure that happens? How important is development generally, house building in particular, to the core city's recovery from COVID-19? What about the broader spread of activities that councils are responsible for and the, the work that they have to do to, uh, to get all of our services going again? How has the pandemic affected planning and growth in, in our cities? What are the core cities doing to overcome all these challenges and to stimulate growth and development? These are all questions of interest to our sponsor today, which is the developer First Base, which has delivered some fabulous mixed use schemes in London like Printworks and is now moving further afield with schemes in Brighton and Hove and the Soapworks mixed use project on two and a quarter acres of Bristol. That scheme will be of no small interest to one of our panellists today, and I'm delighted to welcome Marvin Rees, the Mayor of Bristol. Hi. Alongside Mayor Rees, Marvin, it's a pleasure to welcome two more long-standing friends of 3Fox, Ken Nettleship, the Business Expansion Specialist for Invest in Nottingham. Morning, Ken. Morning. And Chris Murray, Director of Core Cities UK. Hi, Toby. And joining them with the burden of representing the private sector in this discussion, but bearing it very lightly, I hope, is Elidi Obo, Director of Partnerships at First Base. So our programme this morning uh, is going to start in a couple of minutes with us setting the scene, asking each of the panellists to spend five minutes describing how the pandemic has affected their work, uh, with a focus where possible on planning and development and what they're doing to overcome these challenges. We're then going to move on and spend a little time looking at how important the development and growth are going to be to recovery, but also asking each of our panellists what we'd ask of government to support them in their efforts to drive recovery forward. Mayor Rees is going to have to leave us at 11.45, but the rest of the panel are going to be pleased to respond to the most popular questions that you, the viewers, have been asking. Use the Q&A function in Zoom to put questions to the panel all the way through this session, please. Uh, and to vote for the questions you'd mo most like us to respond to later on. Throughout this uh, session, we're going to have several polls running. Uh, they'll pop up on your screen, and if you can complete them as they appear, uh, your responses will form part of our report, which will be available to you along with a video of this session at the website thevoiceofauthority.co.uk from tomorrow with a following wind. And we'll wind up at midday. Um, we've been pretty good at uh, stopping the clock at 12 o'clock on the button so you can all go back to uh, Zoom or Teams or whatever else your, your next session is taking place on. So let's get to the meat of the discussion today. Um, how has the pandemic affected our core cities and the work of local authorities in running them? In particular, how has it affected growth, development and planning? Uh, Marvin Rees, in Bristol, what's the, what's the picture? Well, I mean, the, the big elephant in the room is the impact on our finance because that spills over into everything else. Um, and I am going to make a blatant point here about working with national government. It's not a party point. It's just what happened. Um, at the beginning, we were told local authorities were on a webinar call with the Secretary of State, and we were told, do whatever you need to do uh, to tackle this pandemic, and we will cover the cost. Um, since then, that's proved not to be as strong a promise um, as it initially sounded. Um, we faced, uh, we estimate about 29 million pound increased costs through, through the pandemic. The two 1.6 million pound tranches of money that government gave out, gave, uh, gave out turned into 26 and a half million for us, which you can see is two and a half million pound uh, short. 
Um, but on top of that, we estimate that we have lost about 80 million pounds in revenue that is not as yet being recognized. When you balance all that, that's an 83 million pound hit to uh, local government. So you've got the crisis of the pandemic and now you've got the major cities. And I think Chris will say, this is a challenge for all core cities now. You've got all the cities looking at financial cliff edge um, over the coming, uh, um, uh, coming months. Now, that does a couple of things. One is your intellectual capacity and your is clearly on survival uh, a bit as an organization, um, but also it impacts on your, on your um, ability to function, your, your capacity. Um, so we are facing very difficult decisions and we're going to have to about, well, how much capacity do we actually have to do what we need to do as a local authority to unlock the city? Um, so that's our challenge. When I apply that to the challenge we took on, when I, when I came in, I, I, I talk, we've made ha delivering housing our top priority in Bristol. Um, 460,000 people, city growing by, uh, for, you know, five to 600 families in temporary accommodation. The city's gonna grow by 100,000 or so people over the next 25 years. We have a housing crisis today. We have to, we have to meet that and it's gonna, it's gonna grow. When I asked developers the problem in Bristol, they said it was a lack of political will and the city was bottlenecked. So we put, we put direct resource into unlocking the city, um, unlocking our land, uh, build, rebuilding relationships, rebuilding trust. And I think there's been a genuine recognition that the relationship with the developers has changed and we, we've got a bit of a can-do attitude at last. But clearly that's gonna come under strain. Um, we have some major development opportunities around Temple Quarter, the train station, the half billion pound university campus, LNG on Temple Island and all uh, Temple Court of St. Philip's Marsh behind that. We have Western Gateway, uh, sorry, um, the, uh, which, uh, Western Harbour, which is at the end of the docks. Beautiful land covered by a spaghetti junction built in the 50s and 60s, you know, at the moment. Um, but we're facing very real challenges about the, the capacity of our economic development team to bring that stuff forward so we can be a dependable, predictable, dynamic uh, partner in, in, in making stuff happen. So I'd say that's one of the, the biggest challenges. If I can just touch broadly, and I won't get into the detail on it, but clearly as well, we also have to think about the impact of some of the social implications of COVID and the consequences of the action we're taking to control COVID on our economic development, mental health, compounding educational inequalities, um, you know, people recovering from domestic violence, the loss of business, uh, and which is a slow, you know, which is that disinvestment in our in our economy as well. These are all things that um, we're seeing as major challenges. Thanks, Marvin. I, I was talking to, to one local authority doing an interview for, for Voice of Authority uh, last week, and they mentioned that there were 10,000 people in their borough, a single borough of London, that they had suddenly come into contact with because their lives were so precarious that COVID-19 had tipped them over into, into situations of dire need. And, and when they were setting up their hubs, through which they're contacting people in need in, in local areas who need food, who need medicine, who need care, maybe even just need someone to talk to. Uh, they suddenly come into contact with them and, and realize just how many people are living right on the edge of, of being able to survive. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so the, the government shielding program identified people that turned up on the National Health Service list, but it didn't, it didn't identify the people that we knew or that faith groups, community-based organizations knew were on the, on, the edge of, on the edge of survival and literally were going out of food. Fortunately, in the city, we've done quite a lot of work over the last few years on tackling hunger. Um, so Bristol's a very wealthy city, um, but we have about 20% of our kids um, you know, at risk of hunger every day, and that's compounded through holiday hunger. So we, and that's interestingly, that, that whole feeding Bristol um, initiative has not necessarily just been driven by the council the business community have been a huge part of that and, and when government uh, didn't support us last year they gave out grants rather than giving bits of money to all the major cities it was a zero-sum competition for who could get a million pounds each they put eight million pounds gave it to eight cities a ridiculous way of doing it so we didn't get anything but our business community stepped up we as a council put 25 grand in the pot and the business community came up with the other hundred and we managed to get about 60,000 meals out to kids last summer holidays. So that machinery was reoriented towards tackling hunger um, at this time. So we were getting food out before the government food arrived. So, um, yeah, so we've been aware, uh, but uh, many more people are turning up in need.
there's a, there's a really important thread there, I think, on on for the development industry on on um, on how they can contribute, how they can help uh, local authorities in in dealing with some of these issues, which um, which if, if if they're not looked after, are going to impede growth, are going to impede recovery, and and will will be a problem for everybody. Um, and and certainly, we one of our webinars looked at uh, the Do Some Good campaign, where the property industry is contributing all sorts of things from equipment to money to people all sorts of resources to the nhs to, to help support them through through the crisis so yeah important thread there um ken uh, is there much resonance there from from the point of view of of nottingham and and your your focus specifically on sort of inward investment on economic development how how, how have you been uh, hit by covid19 well i think um certainly as marvin sort of touched on one of the biggest impacts that we've had certainly working with colleagues in the city council has just been that demand on services and um, particularly from our business community you know getting the the funding the grant programs out there you know we don't have the largest economic development team um, and so they have been at full capacity and beyond you know we're supporting them as an external organization in terms of providing business support um, helping you know signposting businesses you know when this first happened it was trying to figure out where to go, who to speak to, how to access funding. And so that's brought a huge sort of increase of uh, of demand on the services. And so a lot of the other economic development work that we would normally be doing around business growth and and support is almost taking a bit of a a backstop really and and is on hold. Um, And we are, you know, if we look to the development world within Nottingham, you know, we still have projects that are going ahead. As, as Marvin said, there are some huge sort of regeneration projects that are happening in the city. Um, about two billion pounds worth of just in our south side of the city. And that is, you know, a lot of those projects are still going ahead and have been active during this time, which has been great to see. What you don't want to see is a city centre where everything comes to a standstill. Um, we still have some bigger projects like our Broadmarsh Shopping Centre, which you know, we're still trying to figure out where um, the, the, the developer who are, who are building that, where that's going, because it's into and it went in a particularly great position prior to uh, um, COVID-19. Um, but that's, you know, that, that will be something that the City Council is really working uh, with them on to, you know, and, and we're also a, a part owner in that scheme as well. So we're very keen to see how that project continues and, and starts up again. But I think, yeah, one of the, the biggest things that we have seen um, is still that businesses are, are still going ahead and they're, they're expanding. You know, part of the work we do is inward investment. Um, we're still receiving inquiries of companies that are either coming into the UK or coming or expanding out of London. So that's, you know, that's been really positive. There has been some normality during this time. Um, and certainly, you know, when I look back to when I was working um, in Nottingham at the end of the, the, the 2008 recession, um, you know, it was a similar, it was a similar scenario to what we're seeing now. So we're seeing a lot of similarities to that time. I think from a business perspective, the one advantage that we have is that a lot of our developments were um, that were we were talking about back then. Um, some of them we're still talking about now. Um, but they are actually in the ground, you know, we've broken ground, think buildings are coming out um, of the ground, which is really, really positive. Um, and funding is still coming in for some of those bigger schemes. We're seeing um, private sector developers still coming in into the city, um, making announcements of projects going ahead, particularly around housing. Again, as, as Marvin said, that's a real focus for this, the city um, and, and the surrounds, the conurbation around the city. So there's a lot of housing projects which are still going ahead and we have that, that housing demand. We have that shortfall on um, council owned housing or, or um, uh, sort of, um, affordable housing as well. But those pro- projects are, are, are still happening to, to some extent. So there's, there are certainly some positive signs that we're seeing in, in Nottingham. Um, it's just uh, the impact, again, the fallout on our local businesses and what that will look like, which is one of the priorities we're going to be focusing on over the next sort of six to 12 months. Um, You know, we're already seeing some job losses being announced within the city um, and therefore that that will impact on the overall prosperity of of the city and the people that are living here. 
Um, so that will then have that ripple effect onto onto the wider economy. Yeah. Um, you know, big okay. air, air, sorry. Are you able to sort of put a, a, a finger in the air and, and, and give us an idea of, as a, com, compared to the same time last year, this, the, the, the number of inquiries you're getting from, from companies looking to locate, the, the, the number of uh, investments that are coming in, the number of developers that are looking to start up schemes, as a percentage, what, what sort of figure is it this year compared to last year at this, this time? Well, I mean, certainly from new developments, I mean, there has been a particular drop off, but I think last year we were probably at the top of our curve in terms of interest coming into the city for, for new development projects. Um, we, we tend to act as a bit of a, a initial buffer between ourselves and our planning authority of developers coming to us and sort of almost asking us to set the scene for Nottingham. So sort of say, well, why should we be coming to Nottingham? What's the opportunity? You know, what are the demographics? What's the age profile? What are university students doing after they graduate? Things like that. And that was certainly at a peak this time last year. Um, it's, and, and obviously, um, you know, post MIPIM, uh, things like that, that, that obviously didn't happen this year. Um, it, there's always that, that, big, that big spike. So it's certainly down. Um, I'd probably hazard a guess sort of you know 60 70 percent down from what that period was but we were we were probably you know riding right the crest of the wave I think at that that particular time so it's a it's a difficult one to, to to look at in terms of the inward investment inquiries you know the business is looking to come into the city um, we've seen a lot come through the Department for International Trade there's a lot of foreign investment that seems to be interested in the UK right now and interested in kind of a post-COVID sort of world as well. You know, the sectors that we're seeing are around health technology, e-health, um, a lot of um, innovation uh, businesses that are looking to, to come into the UK and provide solutions, I think, into, into the, what the, the new world will look like, whether it's in terms of healthcare provision, um, or um, new products and services that will be more web-based than, than they have been previously. Thanks very much, Ken. That's, a, that's a positive news. Um, Chris, um, how does this, these experiences that we've heard about, how, how common are they to, um, to the core cities of the UK? And, and how, what's the sort of range of experiences of, of, of the cities of the last couple of months? Uh, and, and, and what are the sort of broader sort of structural um, issues um, caused by the pandemic? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Toby. I mean, they are <clears throat> they are wholly shared issues, and I don't think you know there's a piece of paper between uh, the issues that Marvin and, and Ken have raised and, and the other core cities, and indeed other places as well, other towns and cities uh, around around the UK. Um, so, I, in, in terms of the, the kind of financial crisis for local government, and Marvin, um, you know, explained that I think very clearly. But just to put a different figure on that, for just the eight English core cities, the, the deficit that they're looking at at the moment, directly as a result of C19, uh, is around a billion pounds. And a very small percentage of that has currently been uh, funded by the packages from central government. So I think the, there are two points that I would make from that. The first is that um, the crisis itself has kind of lifted the lid off the relationship uh, between um, the public sector and public services and our economy, a well-functioning economy and what that looks like and the connections between the two. Um, and the second is that actually the only way to get through the, uh, the short to medium term in terms of the crisis and to maintain our economic base and competitiveness is through uh, uh, national and local state intervention. Um, now, I'll just share a, a slide with you, if I may. Um, <clears throat> and uh, can you just tell me if that's come up? Yep, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, so this, uh, what this slide shows you is uh, data, all the economic data across all the core cities over the last 40 years. And if we go back to the 1970s and 80s, you can see that actually they were more productive than London. And we forget that. But gradually, over time, they've lost their ability to be resilient to economic shocks and then to recover from them. 
and you can see the various dips here where the, uh, the, the, the graph goes down and then back up again. Uh, and these are um, significant economic shocks to the UK economy. The really significant one at the end there being 2007, 2008. And the reason for that is starting with deindustrialization. We just did not invest properly in um, the economies of our uh, cities and city regions outside of uh, outside of the southeast, um, and th the result of that has been a set of structural issues within uh, the UK economy, particularly in regions and city regions outside the southeast, that have been accelerated and worsened by uh, the current crisis. And if we don't address those, if we don't address those underlying uh, structural challenges in the economy, then the recession that we're facing will be far worse and far longer uh, than actually it needs to be. But those challenges are, as I've said, around low productivity, particularly regional disparity, the regional economic difference uh, across the UK, which is the, the worst uh, in Europe. Um, the, the changes that we're seeing uh, are driving things like uh, accelerated shifts in uh, sectors around um, retail, uh, the way in which we use city centres, the kinds of development that we might need uh, into the future. It's, it's really critical to get this right in the core cities because they represent, uh, along with their city regions, 26% of the UK economy. Um, most of them are performing below the national average. Bristol is actually the only core city that performs above the national average. If we brought them all up to the national average, that gives you an additional 70 billion into the UK economy every year. So it's absolutely critical that we do focus on these places. That's not to say that other places aren't important and we need to understand uh, the economic links between them. We've got to get our urban cores right because actually other places are really going to be struggling uh, without that. And development in its broadest term, and I've seen some questions come up about this, my way of using that term would be to include uh, regeneration actually is, is, is critical uh, to that. Um, the things that will drive that are investment into skills in the labour market to uh, help places to reskill, to adapt to the changes that are taking place, to actually ask questions about what changes we would like to take place you know, around a greener economic future investment into more investment into innovation and r d uh, digitization you know which i mean what we're doing now just says everything we need to know about that the knowledge industry and so on but also it's important to understand that this links to marvin's point that low productivity is linked to deprivation in cities so investing in business and innovation and so on deals with about 60 percent of the challenge that's ahead of us 40% of it is actually people with low or no skills, very distant from the labour market. And that situation is gonna, gonna worsen, you know, if we don't uh, focus on it very, very clearly and boldly. And, you know, we'll come on to that in the second question, I'm sure. Um, there's been some talk about, you know, cities reducing in importance or people even leaving cities and kind of fleeing to the, to the suburbs and, and rural areas after C19. And I, I find that, very woolly thinking indeed. It's certainly not what investors um, or uh, uh, um, construction companies are saying to us. What they want access to is strong, hyper-local labour markets for the future, and cities offer that ready-made, shortened supply chains, you know, localization rather than uh, globalization. Um, and all of those things have impacts uh, for the for the planning and development and regeneration community, which rely on strong local economic ecosystems. But I do, think, I do think those things raise big questions for the way that we plan and, um, uh, and develop our cities for the future. And I'd like to come back to that uh, in the second question. And you know, what are we doing about all that as a group of cities? Well, we're working together to share practice, share ideas, but to try and generate creativity and innovation from the cities and push that back into government and Whitehall. And some of that is working, um, but my final point will be my concern is that the focus at the moment, particularly politically, 
at the national level is on a health response, and that's being portrayed as, as centralised, as command and control. Actually, that's not the case. A lot of that response is from cities, from local areas. And my, my deep concern is that that centralised way of thinking runs over into the economic response. And frankly, I think that would be a disaster and would just give us more of the same in terms of low productivity, low uh, wage recovery and regional disparity. Chris, thank you very much indeed. A clear and, and, and urgent call for, for action there. Um, Elida, I, I imagine that you'd support uh, pretty much all of, uh, all of that as a, as a developer. That's all going to be good for business. But um, give us a little insight into um, the, the effects that pandemic has had uh, on the development industry through your own experience. I suppose as a, as a developer, we are not like many. We take a very people-centred approach to our work. Um, and I think in these unprecedented times, that has, has been and remains our key focus. Um, I suppose for me, I think it's forced the industry to um, focus on our most important asset, something that we, we tend to forget. We focus a lot on buildings and bricks and mortar, and sometimes we forget that the most important part of our of what we should be doing, doing is about the community and the people that we are delivering for. So I think one of the things that we've been really focusing on is, is, is that exactly. How do we make sure that our communities are supported in these absolutely challenging times? And I think some people in our industry will say, oh, you know, these are very basic needs, but for us, they're the most crucial things that people need right now. So it is about that massive focus on delivering quality, you know, not just a house, quality, quality housing. We'll focus on that, you know, improving the health and well-being of people. We cannot underestimate the impact and the trauma that people have been through. So the mental as well as the physical health and well-being is absolutely important. And I think one thing we've no one thing that has come out of this is the real need for human interaction and connectivity. And we've got to make sure that we're very cognizant of that in places that we're creating. So I suppose for me it's I think it's 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 pushed it to the forefront. Whereas some people might not have noticed it, it's something that we, we very much our approach, but I think it's forced the industry to really focus on people, which we I must say we've neglected for, for, me, for many, many years. I suppose another thing that I think we, we're seeing as a result of C19 is that importance of our, of, of our towns and our cities and, 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 and the importance of the economies of those. And I think many of you, like me, have spent a much more, much more time now popping to my local high street, spending money, and that the focus on growing our local economy has to be a positive out of this. I think, you know, it's very often that we see places where people just leave, you know, you leave for work and you spend your money somewhere else, but much more that, that focus on our, on, on our local economy and supporting jobs, supporting industry in our local economy has to be, has to be a, a good thing. And I think, you know, like many of you, I've, you know, I've worked in, you know, working, living, socialising, all in one place in a very small, you know, in my home and also in my local area. I think that real blend between living, working and socialising has definitely come out of this. And I think we've got to see that as a positive and we've got to see how we create places in the future enabling that much more. We've got to, and I think echo exactly what the comments made earlier about creating job, you know, enabling jobs in local, in, in, in our towns and cities and supporting industries in our, in our towns and cities. Because these deliver better, better sustainable places. I think, you know, we, our scheme that we're working on in Bristol does that. It's, you know, yes, we're delivering homes, but really important, we're delivering a significant amount of workspace that's going to bring over 2,000 jobs. And that has to, for us, bring in work, you know, work and living alongside social, like social and cultural spaces is a better place. You know, it creates a better place for, for the towns and cities that they're in, and it encourages uh, people to live, work, locally and reduce that desire to leave somewhere to work or leave somewhere to go and socialize so i think for us for me those are the big three things that we've seen um as an as an industry and we are absolutely supportive and, and, and getting behind thanks a lot thanks for that and and there's some um, really interesting threads in that on um on the the use of public places um as as venues for consuming and experiencing culture and how that's going to change with social distancing um, if viruses, either COVID itself, COVID-19 itself, or other forms of, of virus are going to be with us for, for the long term, um, how does that affect the way that we use public places? And, and how does that affect the way you design them? And we'll be picking up on those, um, those threads in, in future webinars. Be really interested in your, in your views on those. Um, 
for now, let's let's move on to the sort of second part of the of the discussion. Um, we 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 understand the scene, and and it, and it's a it's a dismal one. You know, times at times are really really hard. Um, what can we ask of government specifically to to help us uh, through to recovery and to support the recovery strand? And um, and what sort of role can development play in that? We just asked in a in a poll that the viewers whether house building is an important driver for, for recovery and it's kind of a, a mixed response and it's, it's a fairly even split between very, very important and and not very important um so what, what's your view um mary marvin in in bristol oh you're on mute thank you pardon if you could un unmute yeah Thanks, what Mark. i what i want from government is predictability you know i, I want long-term predictable finance um, to get done what we need to get done. Um, on a broader broader front, in the way it's been led, one of the points I've been making is at a time of confusion and potential chaos, what you need to do is stop is minimize the number of surprises, you know, as many as you can. We get surprised with every government announcement at the moment. Uh, we didn't know what they were going to say about schools, we didn't know what they're going to say about business grants. We don't we don't get this note so so constantly at that local level where businesses then come to us and say, oh, as a local authority, what are you going to do? We're working it out once we hear about it on the news with everyone else. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it, I think it's, um, it's not, again, it's not a party point. It's just a failure of the current structure of governance that we've had for the last uh, decades to adapt to where the world is today, which is much more dynamic. Uh, needs to be fleet of foot is post national in, in many ways and it's and the civil service and the old Westminster machinery is cut struggling to catch up with that and, and lacking self awareness but I, I, I what I would like is predictable finance. We have a number of major regeneration schemes in the city that we believe could and cities all over and towns could be a fantastic stimulus for the economy and if if government was to say okay well we don 't know what the model is right now, but I guarantee you right. Temple Meads train station is going to happen. Thank you, right? We are going to work out the finance, right? Um, what we are going to do is we're going to bring through your housing numbers. We're going to work out the finance. If we had a bankable partnership, I don't mean a blank check partnership. I mean a partnership we can depend on um, and that we will work out how to deliver it. Then there's a few things that would happen. One is our city would begin to get more confident, right? If you want to say, actually, I can see the money. I can see the money coming down the line. Secondly, as a local authority working with our city, and I encourage you to look at the Bristol One City Plan. I can maybe drop it into the chat because we've done a lot of work on rallying the whole city to, uh, to write a plan for Bristol. We would then begin to organize our local supply chain. So those local businesses, two, two three firm plumbers, window fitters, floor layers, we get people involved in planning. We could talk to the, the college, um, six forms, college of higher education about that, that supply chain for apprenticeship. We could plan, but we can't plan when we find out, you know, we're, we're on the back foot. So we're being disadvantaged. Um, so that's, that's what we want. We, we, we just need bankable partnership from government. Um, I would say to, uh, my image is, you know, this is a very uh, crass image. When someone is drowning, all right, what they need to do is, is allow themselves to be saved and not think that thrashing around is going to save them relax, work with us, cooperate, and we can do some of that rescue. And the firepower of all those local authorities, the major cities directed towards a joint approach to economic uh, recovery, regeneration, well, survival in the first instance, you could unleash a lot of energy. But at the moment, too much of our energy is spent reacting to government, trying to work out what it means and, and trying to predict in our crystal balls what it might say next. Can I just say to the sector as well, there's a, I think, two, two quick things. One is, if you turn up to cities with approaches to development and regeneration that solve problems, that solve the problems of public health um, and, and um, uh, resilience, and in fact, I had a conference in Bristol a couple of years ago, with Global Parliament and Mayors, one of the topics, and you were involved in that, <laughs> one of the topics was actually pandemics. No one who was talking, you knew then, right, that cities would be on the forefront, building that built, that make us more resilient, tackle inequalities, build social cohesion. If your form of development helps us tackle all those wider issues, you will be very popular on the global stage here in the United States, and particularly with whom I have a strong relationship. Secondly, I would encourage you all to talk in terms of the sustainable development goals. Um, 
these were some kind of abstract goals in the United Nations and local go national governments were kind of talking about them. But I tell you right now, cities are picking these up right now. We're one of them, New York, Helsinki. Um, we were involved, we're involved with the Brookings Institute that's convening cities from around the world to talk about the SDGs. If you begin to frame your work with how it delivers against the, the 17 SDGs, you will, be, you will be mapping yourself into a global conversation that cities are tapping into and want to see, and national governments are struggling to know how they're going to deliver on. So you'd be part of the solution. Could you explain SDGs? I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant, I'm sorry. Okay, so the Sustainable Development Goals were, were come out oh, of the United yep. negotiations out of the, sorry, I should have said, uh, UN, 17 goals. And what I like about them is that they're not single issue campaigns. They're not just climate change. I know mean, I've just, my Twitter feed this morning, someone said, the lockdown is a fantastic opportunity for cycling. I mean, that's a lack of respect to people that are now being beaten up in their homes because they're in abusive relationships. You know, I, I don't go like that. SDGs talk about um, quality work, tackling poverty, hunger, life on land, life at sea, climate change, governance, women's uh, and gender equality. It's, it's the kind of mature, nuanced, rounded approach that meaningful development uh, needs. But like I said, if you begin to map your stuff into those and turn up that local authority saying, this is how we map onto the SDGs, I think you'll be popular locally and nationally. Thank I just you very want, to much. Echo, I want to echo yeah. that, Toby. Yeah. I think uh, you know, we firmly support that. We're working with my regional actually in Bristol now, looking across those development goals. And I think one thing that we've started to do is to respond directly to those. So whether there's education work in a local school, whether it's you know, food growing, that's part of the de development goals. And it's about supporting sustainable food growing and supporting better health for young people and families living in the area. So for us, those SDGs are critical and they should drive development. They shouldn't be seen as a, you know, as something that we've got to do. They should be seen as at the forefront of what we're delivering. Thank you very much, Elida. Um, I'm just launching the, the third of our polls for, for our viewers. And just, just to explain that uh, ticking one is uh, the least important and five is the most important. And the question is, uh, how important is it that recovery programs in core cities are sustainable? Uh, Ken, a question like that, it's very hard to answer in the negative, right? I mean, who, who would say we don't want sustainable development? But what does it specifically mean in, in the case of Nottingham? What are you actually looking for to drive recovery? Um, well, I think, obviously, before all of this happened, um, we launched our sort of um, carbon neutral um, strategy um, where we wanted to be carbon neutral by 2028 and that really was starting to underpin all of our development uh, planning going ahead so um, it linked into how we want to develop our waterside area within the city um, it was really important in terms of making sure that it was based around sustainability it was based around community um, the city itself um, has got a joint venture with with Blueprint, which are a sustainable um, housing developer where, again, talking about that community, looking at how it brings in supply chain, how it brings in skills, um, uh, you know, during the, uh, the building process, but also how it creates community food groups and how it, and, and, and uh, but also links into its wider community. So those kind of initiatives, the city were, you know, were putting into place already. And I think, um, for Nottingham going forward with that, um, certainly around the carbon neutral um, perspective, that's going to be a key driver for any developer that is coming into Nottingham. It's got to look at how it's going to link into that. You know, how does it, um, you know, it, does it have an over-reliance on transport? Is it, is, is it community, uh, linked in, in terms of cycle routes and um, other um, sort of public transport networks as well, but also how it links into our energy networks. Um, you know, we've got a, a large um, sort of city council owned energy network within Nottingham. How is it going to link into, into that? How can we expand that network and again, re take reliance out of the grid and also reduce energy poverty uh, in the city? I think that was one of the reasons why the city council went down the route of expanding um, the district heating network. Also why it sort of created its own energy company you know, through the, the um, Robin Hood Energy, um, which other local authorities have taken on board and, and are using that because it's looking at how um, it can um, impact on local communities and local people so that there isn't that over-reliance on, on, on the big four or, you know, the new supplies that are, are coming out as well. So I think looking forward that the sustainability has to be a, a key on the agenda coming into, this, in, into Nottingham. 
Um, I think I, I agree with, with with Marvin. I think around the skills agenda as well. I think how developers are coming in and linking with local colleges, um, how they're going to work with local communities, and not just pay lip service to doing um, a consultation sort of session for a few nights in a uh, you know, but actually how they work with the communities, how they solve problems for the city, um, how it increases social cohesion. You know, I think certainly looking at, at cities that I've worked in over the years, a lot of developments have almost been dropped in in isolation of each other. Um, and they haven't looked at how they link and how they become part of the fabric of the city, not just from a physical perspective, but from a social and community perspective. Um, and I think that that's something we'd certainly want to see more of in Nottingham. I think we've, we may have learned from our mistakes in the past, certainly from developments back in the 60s and 70s, where we have almost created mini islands around the city centre. Um, and how we can rectify that. You know, we look at the island site, which is a huge regeneration scheme, which would link in um, certainly one of the more deprived areas of the city into the city centre. Right now, it's a huge wasteland. What we can't do is go and put on, you know, um, quarter of a million pound flats that are way out of reach of most of the people that live within the community that's right next door. It has to be integrated. It has to create public spaces. It has to create community spaces that not just those people who are going to live in those nice new shiny flats are going to live in, but actually the communities around them can actually enjoy and be part of. So I think, um, yeah, certainly reflecting on what, what uh, Marvin and uh, a lady have said, I think that has to be something we, we have to focus on for, for Nottingham going forward. Great stuff, Ken. Thank you. That's a, that's a real simple how-to guide for any developer who wants planning permission in, in Bristol or in Nottingham. Simple how-to guide, step by step. <laughs> that's all you've got to do. Uh, Chris, um, would, would those measures apply to, um, to every city across uh, the UK, all the core, core cities? And, and what, what can we ask government to do to support us in, in, uh, in, in, in those objectives? Okay, so I, I absolutely they, they do apply. And I think what we you know, what we have at the moment is a kind of common experience, um, like almost like never before, really, in terms of what we're experiencing uh, in cities, certainly within our lifetimes. And there is a massive opportunity, I think, to be grasped here alongside the, you know, the real challenge and difficulty uh, that we're seeing to reimagine cities for the future, to see them as those kind of greener, more inclusive, uh, economies that understand what makes a place work well and also how how that then impacts this kind of the, the sort of relationship the interaction between us as human beings and the urban environment in terms of our uh, physical and emotional well-being so I've got a particular point on that but I think just before I get into that what, what should government do now in terms of the economic response for our cities I think there are four absolutely key things which sort of <clears throat> build on what's been what's been said the first is very clearly we've got to maintain as much of the economic and employment and also public service base as we possibly can you know we should really be putting uh, as much support in place as we can around those things to get us through uh, the coming months once we get through that we need to make sure that business and the uh, public services and public transport networks on which we'll rely for the future, which may also have to adapt, can then recapitalise. They can service the debt that they've taken on. Uh, they can reskill so they can understand what, uh, what kind of skills they need within their business to adapt and how the business itself might need to adapt for the future as well, and indeed public services. The third is that I, I think we need a very bold, large scale program of uh, stimulus investment to uh, get business to the next stage, uh, to uh, create jobs. And we need to link that to a large scale labour market intervention uh, around skills and employment programmes that have to be locally driven and based on the knowledge of how those th two things come together in cities. We've had good, good and bad examples of this in the past, but by and large, we've done skills and employment here and job creation there, and we haven't brought those two things together. And, you know, to state the obvious, we've got to do that. The fourth is that 
to make all of that work, and this was kind of one of Marvin's key points, we've got to decentralise. We are really behind the pack internationally on this. We are the most centralised state in the developed world, and it's not just us saying that. We brought the OECD in to work with Core Cities last year, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, and they said very clearly, one of the things that is holding you back as a group of cities and undermining your productivity is the centralised nature of the state, which affects our agility, it affects our ability to understand uh, the fine grain of what investment is needed at the local level. And, you know, I think you can argue that it's affected the, the health response uh, to C19 as well. In terms of the development um, and uh, construction and planning regeneration community, that, that's, those sectors themselves need to adapt to what, as well and to understand what kind of different future we want and need and have to create for our cities. And, you know, Aladi touched on this. I mean, urban design has to come back onto the agenda in a major way, uh, in the way, I think perhaps even more so than it was in the days of CABE, Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, of which I declare an interest. I used to work for them. Um, last year uh, was uh, the 100 year anniversary uh, of the Bauhaus, uh, probably the most influential design movement of all time. It certainly had a very deep and lasting influence, you know, not always for the better, uh, but mostly on, on cities, in, uh, certainly in the West. And uh, we, did, we did a project where, um, we, uh, uh, with a, uh, a colleague, we asked if the Bauhaus was still going now, if it hadn't been shut down by the Nazis, or if you were going to reinvent it for today, what would it do? And I think the answer is, it would be focused on cities and it would look at, or it would use its multidisciplinary approach to focus on all the different elements of what makes a city work well, digging down into issues of psychology and mental health, of uh, physical well-being alongside the economy, social structures, as well as design and how those things relate. And so I think there is an opportunity now to do that, to do that thinking. And actually, that's something we could do ourselves, the development community, cities, others coming together to kind of refresh our thinking and reimagine that different future. And of course, we need government support, but there's something we could get on with. So your, your, your seminar on urban design, you know, that might be a, a kind of starter for 10 for that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. We're already on to next week's seminar, right? <laughs> Thanks very much, Chris. Um, Elida, we've lost um, Marvin viewers because he's gone to talk to MPs. He's got an urgent meeting with MPs. Hopefully he's taking our messages to them and, uh, and right now lobbying for, for more investment um, uh, and, and, and more support from, from central government for, for our sector. Um, and we're getting some questions in from, from our viewers um, that are much broader than, than uh, development based. So looking, what, what, what about the rest of society? And, and Marvin raised some, some disturbing issues really about how we perhaps ignore uh, some of the things that are going on when we look at some of the environmental benefits that we're experiencing, some of the lifestyle benefits that we're experiencing, there are also some really dark things going on in terms of domestic abuse. And, uh, and, and, and as I mentioned before, um, the, the particularly vulnerable people are just being tilted over into, into really desperate situations now. So it's, I guess it's important whenever we're having these conversations to try not to sound too crass while life and death things are happening on one side, we, we've got to focus on, on our role in, in the economy and, and, and how we head towards recovery. And, and on that note, um, Elida, um, would you like to pick up on, on any of these themes? And, and would you like to talk a little bit about what the private sector, how the private sector might benefit from, from government intervention in terms of driving recovery? Um, I think from our experience, um, key from central the central government is about investing in infrastructure, whether that's physical, uh, you know, or digital infrastructure. Uh, so that has to be a fundamental um, piece of you know investment to enable growth. Um, I think for us as well, it's about having a partnership approach. You know, government can't do it on their own, and I think you know having a real um, approach to working alongside a private sector to 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 deliver is is important. Um, we believe that you've got to invest long term. We're not trying to, you know, make a quick buck or turn things around overnight. This is about having a long term view, investing for the long term, not expecting immediate returns, and really seeing that, you know, 
you know, being there for the long term to, 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 to realise those key, those benefits. But I think for me, you know, that, that's all part of what government can do. But I think as an industry ourselves, we've got to focus on, you know, growth, not just being about economic growth. It has to be about inclusive growth. Uh, and I think working in Bristol for the past gosh, two and a half years now, there are lots of, it's, there are lots of disparities. And I think Marvin um, mentioned those, was spot, was spot on in, in those, you know, we are working in, in communities that have not only they're deprived already, and now we have C19, which has now intensified those, those issues that people are facing every day. And I think we cannot deliver, you know, 200, 300 million pound schemes and not have a positive impact on people's lives. So for us, we start, and I think uh, um, Ken mentioned earlier, we have, to, we have to knit ourselves into that community. And we spend a lot of time getting to know those communities and looking at how we can make a positive impact on those. So, yeah, and, and I think that's, it, it, it's, it's our duty to do that. And for me, I see inclusive growth as a fundamental part of what, you know, it's at the front and center of what we do alongside, of course, we've got to make money. But we also have to focus on, you know, improving life chances for people in, in those communities, which Marvin rightly talked about earlier on. I think, it, again, you know, it's about making sure that whatever growth we're delivering does not have a negative impact on our, on our environment, and whether that's, you know, improving biodiversity, net zero carbon, but also everything else, you know, about education, about health and well-being, um, about, you know, sustainable food, all the things that are important, we've got to make sure that's part of our growth, the growth story, um, and making sure that we're taking people alongside that with us. So I guess in around, you know, in probably not the typical response you'd expect from, from a developer, but it's certainly from, from, from our perspective and our experience, that's exactly what people, people want and need, especially in these times. Thanks a lot. I'm going to put to you a question from uh, uh, viewer Jerry O'Connell. Um, so we talked a little bit here about, about government um, and what government can do um, uh, to, to help support recovery. Your partnerships director at a, at a major UK developer, um, what would you ask local authorities to do to support uh, a return to house building, to support development and, and, and growth? Are there any specifics that, that you'd like local authorities to be looking at? I think, again, Marvin mentioned earlier on, a can-do approach has to be key. You know, um, the um, open-mindedness, I think as a developer, we don't just believe that housing regenerates. We think you've got to deliver workspace and you've got to deliver the social and cultural spaces because people want place. They don't just, they just, they need a home, but they also need somewhere to work and they need the social spaces that knit communities together. So having that open-minded approach. And I think really, really looking forward, I think that long-term view for us is key. We don't, we as developers are not focused on the immediate, you know, we don't want to make a quick buck tomorrow. We want to be in that community for the long term. So, you know, we want local authorities to be looking at working with partners who have that approach because that's where you deliver the best places. That's how you invest in your communities and that's how you create better towns and cities. Thanks, Elida. Um, Ken, um feel free to pick up on, on, on any of those points. Um, but looking through some of the, the questions that the, the viewers are asking, um, there's a lot here um, retreading some of the ground that we've covered, but, but perhaps it's worth looking at it um, in terms of specifics. So um, evidence is materializing, Hayden Scarborough uh, uh, says, about uh, the benefits to environment of, of changed normal behaviors. And again, I stress this is not to ignore uh, some of the darker things that, that are happening. Um, but how can core cities take advantage of the pandemic in relation to decarbonisation specifically? Can, is, that, is that something that, that you can look at? Um, well, I, I certainly think that, that there is an opportunity to, to take advantage of that. You know, if you're looking at um, travel to work methods, if you're looking at travel to work patterns within cities, I think it's looking at those non-essential journeys which people take as well. Um, and therefore putting in, you know, sort of uh, increasing the, uh, the stress on the on, on, on cities infrastructures. And, um, you know, I think a lot of cities suffer from the similar thing to, you know, sort of 1950s and 60s planning and 70s in, as well. Um, you know, we, we like to uh, cut off city centres from uh, from the city, set, you know, from the other surrounding areas just by, by using roads. So I think it is about um, looking at how we can continue that sustainable transport methods. I noticed there was a question around, you know, e-scooters and, and bike programs and cycling, you know, sort of bike programs within cities. Um, I think just this week, you know, we've announced that there's going to be a, an e-scooter trial happening in, in Nottingham. 
Um, we've had um, our own sort of public bike um, schemes which have been operating over the past few years, which predominantly were used by the university students within, you know, that were traveling between city campuses. So it'd be interesting, having not ventured into the city center in the past few weeks, it'd be interesting to see what the usage of those has been like and whether that's increased in, in time. Um, I think in Nottingham, we've been very much focused on sustainable transport and, and uh, reducing carbon emissions for the past few years. You know, we've, um, we've had the, uh, the much talked about uh, workplace parking levy, which was about um, putting charges on, on workplace car parking spaces for companies that had, you know, uh, large numbers of spaces and were contributing to um, congestion. And so, we, you know, we're very much about looking at reducing congestion, re improving air quality and also cutting down non-essential journeys but also making putting the onus back onto the private sector to sort of say well how are you developing your own travel to work plans how are you looking at green methods of transport for your staff and how are you trying to and it was almost we as much as the spaces were being charged for and some businesses saw it as, as, as a tax we're also trying to implement methods and schemes and programs to actually reduce their need for people to travel to work by car and it was you know it was kind of a twofold thing we were putting the money raised into transport projects but also at the same time trying to help businesses sort of look at the future rethink their how staff access their their workplaces and i think that's going to be one of the biggest things that we'll see the change in you know talking about office spaces and things like that and you know the office space of the future is going to look very different to what it did two months ago, never mind, um, you know, a year ago kind of thing. It, that um, how do you plan workspaces um, with C19 in mind around social distancing and things like that? So how much of a need will we need huge, you know, sort of office schemes being built for large scale occupiers? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's a really important question. Chris, if, if you, you look at the, the core cities as a group, are, are some cities better placed than others to, to be responding to these sorts of, uh, of changes? Uh, that's a, that, that, that's a handing my noticing uh, question. <laughs> answer, <laughs> answer that right one of the wrong way. They are, of course, all extremely well placed. Uh, I think what, what I would say is that you know, I mean, I go back to those original points about what you need in your economic um, ecosystem in order to uh, be resilient and to recover. And I mean, echoing Marvin's point about a wider definition of resilience. And the, all the core cities are getting there. They are getting there. They are certainly in a stronger position than they were um, a few decades ago, but because of um, partly to do with a lack of investment uh, in skills and labor market and certain kinds of infrastructure, but also because of the, the centralized nature of our decision-making um, architecture, they're not as, in a strong position as their counterparts internationally. So I think this is a fundamental issue that has to be uh, addressed going forward. I hope that's a kind of adequate uh, answer to that. But there is, there is a really big opportunity here that we're all talking about in different ways, because what, you know, what successive governments and uh, across parties and indeed the coalition have not really liked is very large scale market interventions to, sh to shift our economy into, in a different direction and we're in a position where we've got no choice but to do that at the moment so we're in the middle of the biggest uh, set of market interventions we've seen in living memory you know uh, probably in, in the in the, the post-war era so let's make those the right interventions we're doing it anyway so let's drive the economy toward a position where it's going to become uh, much more competitive globally than, than it is at the moment than you know where we were headed um, prior to C19 and that is things like uh, driving a green recovery uh, digitization you can see this in other countries that are not particularly interventionist I mean South Korea for example just digitized massively um, about 10-15 years ago and the effects of that on their economic downturn are very, very clear up now. Um, Germany has a much more federal state. You can see the ways in which that has enabled them to manage their economy 
uh, through through the current crisis and so on. I think, I think that's that's absolutely right, Chris. And I, I think I, I, we've witnessed a, a massive change from everybody working in offices, as we have done for, for 20, 30, 40, 50, countless years, to the entire population, working population virtually, working from home in the space of a week. Uh, and if we can do that, then surely we can digitize the, the, the economy in, in a similar speedy uh, fashion if we have the will. Um, what an absorbing discussion uh, and, and what a wide ranging one for a single hour. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I hope everyone's taken some, some useful insights uh, away from, from the conversation today. I take this opportunity to, to thank our speakers um, on behalf of all of our viewers uh, and assume you're all applauding uh, virtually at home. Um, Chris Murray, uh, Elida um, Obo. Uh, Ken Nettleship and Marvin Rees, thank you very much indeed for your time. I, I know it's under intense pressure uh, at, at the moment and, and it, we're particularly grateful for you to, to spare the time today to, um, to share your experiences with us. Uh, thank you viewers for your attention and, and your probing questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them, but, but hope we answered uh, enough to, to whet your appetites for, for further conversations to come. Um, don't forget tonight at 8 p.m. when everyone's applauding the NHS to spare a thought for council employees uh, around the country who are also on the front line keeping people alive during this crisis just as much as uh, anyone in the NHS uh, and, and, and very unsung. Um, you'll find a recording of this and a report of this session uh, at the voiceofauthority.co.uk tomorrow along with uh, 130 fascinating interviews with top people at councils. Our next session, next Thursday at 11 a.m., do we need a strategy for key worker housing? I uh, look forward to joining uh, you all then. In the meantime, thank you to First Base for making all of this possible. Much appreciated. Goodbye from our panel and from everyone at 3Fox. Goodbye. Bye.